On December 30th, 1927, The Jazz Singer became the first commercially successful film to release with sound. By the end of 1928, one in every five films had sound. By the end of 1929, it was four in five. And by 1930, less than 1,000 days after a single line took the world by storm, silent films had gone the way of the dinosaur. At our first Academy Awards, only one of the 24 nominated works was a sound one. At the second Academy Awards, over half of our 28 films are sound films, at least in some capacity. The Jazz Singer was considered too advanced for competition at the first awards, but it had quickly been outpaced and was primitive compared to the films tonight. But talking pictures were creaky, full of muffled audio, stilted dialogue, and line delivery that makes you question if any of these actors had ever seen a play. Yes, and it's going to be tough on the guy who did it. Like last episode, I watched every film nominated across all categories tonight, but unlike last time, this wasn't a journey full of hidden gem after hidden gem. There was very little gold at the end of my journey, and most of my stops along the way were more akin to dysentery than discovery. If the second Academy Awards was a journey, it's one I'd recommend skipping. But still, I'll do the legwork for you and explain what you missed. There's some interesting notes here, including the first instance of pandering for votes, the film that is often considered the worst to win Best Picture, the fewest number of categories ever seen in a ceremony with seven, and a really interesting case where not a single film wins more than one award. And I'll cover it all. This is a transitional year for the Academy Awards, and the mediocre films nominated tonight prove one thing. Hollywood believed in the sound film, and they were perfectly content leaving silence in the dust. It's time to answer the question, what can we learn from the second Academy Awards? May I have the envelope? There were several changes between ceremonies one and two. The first ceremony was an intimate affair, 15 minutes long, with the winners known in advance and the ceremony closed to the public. But the second ceremony went bigger. For one, it was broadcast on KNX in Hollywood in a one-hour program on April 3, 1930. Unfortunately, this recording no longer exists, and the radio log page for the Los Angeles Times doesn't even list the broadcast, but the Academy has stated it was aired via KNX, and so we'll take that at face value. What we can confirm is that the ceremony was hosted by William C. DeMille, the second president of the Academy after Douglas Fairbanks. One rule that stayed the same between ceremonies is that two years worth of films were eligible for awards. Last time it was 1927 and 1928. This time, it's 1928 and 1929. Because of that, there's actually one film that would be nominated at both ceremonies, and so we're going to see slight eligibility changes going forward. Another really weird fact about this ceremony is that there weren't even nominees, making it the only ceremony where that is the case. For our purposes, we're going by research that the Academy would do years later, revealing a mostly accurate list of the films that had been considered for awards. But this barrage of facts should show that this second ceremony was arguably just as messy as the first. But let's set the stage and ignore the odd window dressing. We've left the Roosevelt Hotel and moved five miles south to the Ambassador Hotel. The Ambassador Hotel was an iconic Hollywood landmark, hosting six Oscar ceremonies, every president from Hoover to Nixon, and may have kept us from a future president, as it's where Bobby Kennedy was shot and killed. But on April 3rd, 1930, in the iconic Coconut Grove Lounge, DeMille announced the best films of the year. This year, we've got five nominees, and our winner is the Broadway Melody. When looking at pretty much any major ranking of every best picture, the Broadway Melody rarely cracks the bottom five. Most of the time, it's dead last. The film is a vaudevillian musical, following two sisters as they come to New York with dreams of performing on Broadway. It's been described as everything from cumbersome to meandering to pointless to disgraceful, but I feel like this is as good a time as any to talk about the mission statement of this series. We tend to analyze history through a modern lens. When looking at past wars, knowing the eventual victors, it may seem easy to say, how could one side believe they stood a shot? 
When it comes to the Oscars, it's super common for entire Best Picture races to be simplified down to this was the unconventional pick, the better film, but never the one the Academy would award. And this was the safer pick, the one that was always going to win. But that ignores so, so many factors, not least of which are the external factors that have nothing to do with movies. And usually these films don't even fit neatly into these boxes. It's a reductive way to look at what I consider to be the coolest time capsule we have of society over the last century. You see, history is not simply the study of the past, it is an explanation of the present. And it's why I'm trying to go deeper than simply saying, yeah, the Broadway melody stinks and it shouldn't have won Best Film. In order to truly evaluate whether the Broadway melody works, we've got to transport ourselves back in time and understand what people saw in it then. Because trust me, people liked it a lot. The phrase of the night is all talking pictures. Unfortunately though, most theaters in the country couldn't even show these films. Hollywood had fully embraced sound, but that didn't mean every theater in the country did too. By 1930, only about 60% of theaters in America had been wired, meaning they could play sound alongside their films. The other 40% was lagging behind, meaning they were still showing silent films. But when Hollywood released an all-talking picture, they couldn't just throw away 40% of their potential revenue. Thus, two versions of most talking films existed at this time. There was the sound film and the silent film. How'd you hold it? What? So, when we call the Broadway melody an all-talking picture, this is what we're referring to. Actual dialogues spoken by actors presented to audiences as they were shot. Most reviews today call the Broadway melody's audio creaky and muffled, and I would use those words too. But this is so far ahead of literally any other film of 1929, and that is exciting. One of the best reviews of the time is this one by Sid Silverman. He writes that the possibilities are what jolt the imagination. This particular interlude classes as just a hint of what's coming. If the talker studios can top the production efforts of the stage and get the camera close enough to make the ensemble seem to be in the same theater, what's going to happen in Boston between a musical comedy stage at 440 and a screen at 75 cents? And there is the key to all of this. The Broadway melody is basically no more a film than a stage show. Most of the scenes take place on stage with an audience and our actors perform song and dance numbers in full while the camera stays static. But as Silverman states, with the possibilities of sound on film, what's the difference between a musical comedy stage show that costs $4.50 and a movie that costs 75 cents? To people at the time, the Broadway melody opened up the possibility that film could replace the stage entirely. It's why we see sequels simply changing the year at the end of the title. The possibility here was that these films full of songs and dances and musical numbers could be a new art form entirely, and that was exciting. Knowing the direction that film would ultimately go, it's easy to watch the Broadway melody and say, yeah, this is barely even a movie. But let's say this is what movies would ultimately become. Forget dramas and westerns and noirs, imagine a world where the majority of films released in theaters are musicals shot on a stage with painted sets the Broadway melody suddenly becomes revolutionary, and I'd wager its reputation is greatly improved. So is that why the Broadway melody won Best Picture? Because of the singing and dancing and because its audio was better than most other works? Mm, not completely. I think it's a little more complicated than that. The Academy in 1930 was still a relatively small organization. It had grown throughout the year, expanding from 36 original founders to more than 365 full-fledged members, but it was still the brainchild of Louis B. Mayer, and despite the fact that he wasn't the president, his words still held a lot of weight. At the first ceremony, it was rumored that he denied the crowd best picture, as it was, among other things, an MGM film, and he was a founder of MGM. Mayer was worried that if an MGM film won the top prize, people would suspect he rigged the vote. But by the second ceremony, that seemed to no longer be top of mind, as MGM is consistently the winning studio. Of the seven awards tonight, one would go to United Artists, one to Paramount, one to Warner Brothers, one to Fox, and MGM takes home the remaining three. If that wasn't enough, of the 28 films nominated, take a look at the studio breakdown. One in every three films nominated was an MGM one, and suddenly a fairly dry movie like the Broadway Melody gains a bit more steam. 
Thankfully, as we move forward to ceremonies 3 and 4 and 5, Mayor's role in the Academy will diminish, and the organization will grow, increasing their credibility in the process. But the MGM factor is something we're going to see play a big role tonight, and it's my opinion that the Broadway Melody only won due to its MGM status. In fact, of our five Outstanding Picture nominees, one of them, The Hollywood Review of 1929, is literally just an advertisement for MGM movies. The Hollywood Review is such an odd movie that I feel like doesn't get nominated in literally any other year. As said earlier, the first few years of Talking Pictures were full of almost experimental works that challenged the idea of what a movie is or could be. It's a variety show put on by MGM featuring their contracted stars. We've got Buster Keaton, Joan Crawford, Marion Davies, Laurel and Hardy. One result of the still powerful studio system is that stars were owned by their studio. And if Mayer told you you had to spend a day working on the Hollywood Review, you had to do it. So the Hollywood Review is song and dance numbers and comedy sketches and even scenes from Romeo and Juliet and advertisements for other MGM movies, including the Broadway Melody. At the time, all of the stars working on it thought it was going to be a massive misfire. The whole thing is hosted by Conrad Nagel, and he wrote in his autobiography, The Real Tinsel, that everybody said director Harry Rapp was crazy for making it. It wouldn't make a dime, but it was a sensational box office hit because every star at MGM was used. The audience thought they were getting a million dollars worth of entertainment for a buck. And the Hollywood Review of 1929 was nominated for Outstanding Picture. It's weird because you're going to see other MGM films nominated tonight that fit the mold of drama or comedy or adventure. And it's surprising that these two pseudo-musical, pseudo-stage plays are the two that were up for Best Picture. But I'm glad they're there. Historically speaking, Hollywood Review is fun as an artifact, even if it's sort of weird sitting down today and trying to understand what we're supposed to be getting out of this. Two quick points I'll mention is one... MGM's Lion Roar. This is the actual roar. And second, most of the big players in MGM's review were their silent stars. And it has been cited that this was the beginning of the end for silent star John Gilbert, whose voice, heard here, too flattering sweet to be substantial, didn't fit the stoic character he was always typecast as. But beyond all of this, Hollywood Review is a fun, extravagant, self-indulgent love letter to MGM, and it must have pleased Mayer greatly, as it also got rave reviews. So MGM had two horses in the race, but if we're ignoring the sway that Mayer probably had on the results, there are three other options. I want to start with the one that I think had the best shot, In Old Arizona. In Old Arizona follows a cat and mouse game between the Cisco Kid, a notorious outlaw, and Sergeant Dunn, who has been tasked with stopping him. It's made a little more complex with a love triangle and taunting and double crossing, but it's my favorite mainly because it's just an exciting western done pretty effectively. Its main point to note though is that this film is the first ever to feature sound shot outdoors, which is a frankly impressive feat. Compared to the sets of MGM films, where every aspect of the audio is meticulously controlled, In Old Arizona was shot in the national parks of Utah. Honestly though, the film actually does fairly well at avoiding the sounds of birds chirping or the dreaded wind that ruins so many student films. The audio is obviously terrible still, because this is a 1928 film and so of course it is, but we're already making large steps. But speaking of sound, the best part and the worst part of In Old Arizona is Edmund Lowe as Sergeant Dunn. Like me, all right, come on. Like me. Come on that song, you guys. In Singing in the Rain, we follow Lena, a renowned silent actress who is trying to make the transition to talkies, but struggles with the unfortunate truth that her voice is far too annoying. Shouldn't have come. What's that noise? This is played for comedy. But this was a very real issue occurring on dozens of film sets in the late 1920s. Just watch for yourself. Well, why didn't you say so? For my women, nothing but jockey club. For me, Nick. Me and the Bell of Greenpoint. Low made In Old Arizona simultaneously worse and so, so much better. 
I don't think I've ever seen a man bomb this hard on line deliveries. Are you the bomber? And this is in a Best Picture nominated film. In Old Arizona is up for five Oscars tonight, more than any other movie. But it made the movie so much funnier. Lo is our protagonist, the sergeant trying to stop the Cisco kid. But you're really telling me we're supposed to take this guy seriously. Despite the fun that Lowe brought unintentionally, In Old Arizona is still pretty mediocre at best. Lowe's only break in his pursuit of the Cisco Kid comes courtesy of a third party, the highly annoying Tonya Maria, portrayed by Dorothy Burgess in her film debut. Every plot beat comes randomly, and the story progresses passively instead of actively. One of the common themes of the night is that films are most regarded for their use of sound above anything else. And so In Old Arizona being shot outdoors might very well be the reason for its repeated nominations tonight. Hollywood was desperate to fully embrace sound on film, and this work is a pretty important step towards that lofty goal. It didn't much matter that the audio was terrible and Lowe couldn't deliver a line to save his life. This was still shot outdoors, and it was going to be showered with roses. Just look at this full-page ad. For starters, Fox wasn't messing around with this film. It had a limited run before expanding nationwide, and its ad promises six more all-talking features coming soon. Honestly, if not for the fact that the Broadway Melody was an MGM film, I think In Old Arizona is very likely our second best picture. The Academy still doesn't exactly know what types of films to award the top prize to, but in 10 or even 5 years, the goal quickly becomes awarding films that are both technically impressive while also commercially successful. And In Old Arizona was both. It was also the first Western to be nominated for an Oscar, which I consider notable as Westerns are very rarely given their dues in the Academy Awards. And despite disliking In Old Arizona, it was a very good Western, nailing the lawman outlaw face-off in the hot Arizona sun. Then there's Alibi, the United Artists crime film that was so controversial that it would be banned in Chicago. It's a fairly fun police procedural that deals with a murder and a foolproof alibi held by the police's main suspect. Its fun is mainly in an historical sense. This was the first known audio of a Tommy gun being fired, which kind of puts into perspective that we know thousands of sounds from media alone that we've never heard in real life, but that audiences of the 1920s had never heard at all. These audiences may have gone their whole life without knowing the sound of a rushing waterfall, or an eagle screech, or a snake hissing, or a gong striking. We take those sounds for granted, but Alibi is a fun reminder of the educational potential a film can have. It's a fine movie beyond that. If anything, it shows how easy it would have been to get away with murder a century ago. Chick Williams' airtight alibi is that he was at the theater. And all he needs to do to secure this as truth is to rough up a trusted member of society who will corroborate his claim. But I'll mainly give it credit for its sound. The first few minutes of the film consists of a montage of prison-related sounds. And again, for most members of 1920s society, this may very well have been their first introduction to the sounds of chains clinking and bars rattling. While I haven't loved or even really liked most of the films I've mentioned so far, it's super exciting to imagine how novel sound on film would have been in 1929. I don't think Alibi really stood a shot at winning the award though. Most people think its reputation could have hurt its chances, but from researching the case of United Artists vs. Chicago, it didn't seem as though Alibi was banned until June of 1930, two months after the ceremony had concluded. More realistically, I think it was just another full talking picture that had been a hit with audiences, and that was enough to stand a shot at the top prize. Our final Outstanding Picture nominee is... Yeah, the Lost Film Counter is back. Unfortunately, The Patriot is a lost film. Of all of the hundreds of Best Picture nominees, only one is lost, and that's Ernst Lubitsch's The Patriot. This is extremely disappointing for a number of reasons. For one, this is the final silent film to be nominated for Best Picture, until 2011's The Artist. But, more importantly, it looks really good. The footage you're seeing here is from the trailer, which still survives, and it's clear that these sets were huge and grand and opulent, and the film stars Emil Yanning, finally pronouncing that one right, the winner of the first Best Actor Oscar, and a pretty great performer in his own right. 
It's also an Ernst Lubitsch film, and he's one of the great directors of all time. He's known for his comedies, and we'll see several of them pop up in ceremonies over the next decade, but this was a dramatic period piece that seems so unique for him that I really wish I could have seen it. Unfortunately, as we saw last time, lost films are going to be a big obstacle in our journey to watch it all, and so The Patriot remains unviewed for now. Luckily, I did watch the trailer and read the synopsis, but if you've learned anything so far, I think it's possible that The Patriot was actually our least likely Outstanding Picture nominee to actually win. The fact that it was still a silent film represented something the Academy wanted desperately to move away from. Best Writing is a really fun category tonight, for two reasons. First, there's 11 films nominated here, which I think is super cool. This is another consolidated category from last year. Instead of Best Original Story and Best Adapted One, we've got just a single award. I don't love this. It means we've got scripts here that are adapted from plays, novels, short stories, and original works, which is just a little strange. Also, as a writer myself, I think writing needs at least two awards. Having ten losing films here just seems like too many. The winner is actually The Patriot, the Lost Lubitsch film, which was based on a play by Alfred Newman. Not that one. Because I couldn't watch it, I can't comment on the story's quality, but from its plot description, it seems a bit too patriotic for my sensibilities. The other reason Best Writing is a cool category is that it's the first non-acting award that women are up for. If you didn't notice, there was not a single woman up for an award at our first ceremony, as writing and production design and cinematography were very male-dominant fields. Luckily though, this category rectifies it a little bit with three films written by women. Two were written by the same woman, Bess Meredith, making her the first woman in Academy history to be nominated for multiple awards. Let me know by the way if these ridiculous firsts get a bit annoying. Bess Meredith is actually an insanely cool person, and she totally deserves to be remembered more than she is. She got her start as a writer at 13, when she would write weekly fiction columns for her local newspaper. Her introduction to show business was as a singer and piano player, and she transitioned from that into acting. In the early 1920s, she became a co-director and screenwriter, making her a writer, actor, director, singer, musician, all at once. She was also deeply in love with Michael Curtiz, with the two marrying and subsequently divorcing twice. Curtiz reportedly called her multiple times a day for story input on no other film than Casablanca. She really did it all, and it's a shame that her two nominations tonight will be the only two she will ever receive. But how is she as a writer? <sighs> Another lost film. Wonder of Women follows a pianist struggling with his marriage. There's really nothing I can take from that description, but one reviewer did call it a rambling mess that gets an audience squirming a half dozen times. So we're probably not missing much, I guess. The surviving Meredith nomination is A Woman of Affairs, and thankfully this one is actually pretty good. I'd almost argue it's my favorite film I've mentioned thus far, but that's probably giving it a little bit too much credit. It stars Greta Garbo as a woman who deals with tragedy, and John Gilbert as the man who always seems to be by her side. It's one of those right place, wrong time romances, which are fun in a sort of curious way. Meredith does a great job at getting viewers more and more and more excited for Gilbert and Garbo to finally end up together, and she writes the entire thing with a trained eye for pacing and twists. This is also pretty shocking with a suicide 30 minutes in that had to be toned down in accordance with the Hays Code which had finally begun to take effect in 1930. This dance. Meredith's fellow woman nominee was Josephine Lovett, who was recognized for her work on Our Dancing Daughters, a film you may not have heard of, but one that has certainly made an impression on the larger culture. Our Dancing Daughters was a massive hit. It is a fast, loose story about young women in the 1920s and their flapper lifestyle. It turned Joan Crawford from a relative unknown into a massive star, spawned two pseudo-sequels, and was the inspiration to F. Scott Fitzgerald's view of what a flapper was, a depiction he would immortalize in several classic novels. Of Crawford's performance, Fitzgerald had this to say, 
Joan Crawford is doubtless the best example of the flapper, the girl you see in smart nightclubs, gowned to the apex of sophistication, toying ice glasses with a remote, faintly bitter expression, dancing deliciously, laughing a great deal with wide, hurt eyes, young things with a talent for living. When I say Crawford became a star, I mean it. In her own memoir, A Portrait of Joan, she wrote that she was the one person in 1929 made a star without a talking picture. Top executives were so busy worrying about what would happen to Garbo, Shearer, and Gilbert, they had no time to worry about me. And it's a fantastic performance. I can't say how well she embodies the flapper, because literally everything I know about what a flapper was is born from Crawford's performance here. It shaped the way we remember the 1920s today, and that's no small feat. It also was so successful that MGM tapped Harry Beaumont to direct their big picture of 1929, the Broadway Melody. We already know how that goes. So it made a star actress, a star director, a successful trilogy, and shaped the culture of the 1920s. But how does it stand as a film? It's fine. I don't want to dwell on negatives because I think these century-old films should be supported instead of trashed whenever possible, but I found it a bit all over the place. Ironically enough, Josephine Lovett's writing may have been the weakest aspect. As one of the few silent films of the night, it does nail the art of the intertitle, with almost everyone ending in an exclamation point. But it's just a bit messy. The best part of Our Dancing Daughters is easily the cinematography and Joan Crawford's performance. And thankfully, the cinematography is going to get its second nomination there. So I'll talk more about it then. But that was its only nomination. There's no recognition for its art direction, despite these interiors being really grand and well-defined and descript. And there's no recognition for Crawford, possibly because this is a silent film performance in a year of talkies. But that's just a theory. It's really a shame, though, as I think Crawford is great here, and she did a lot to land this role. According to her, she stripped naked in front of the film's producer, and then the film's director. I'm assuming there's a little more to this act, but Crawford never elaborated. Though, when asked if she had ever used the casting couch to win a role, she said, well, it sure beat the hard cold floor. Let's run through the remaining nominees fairly quickly. We've already discussed two. The winning film, The Patriot, which I couldn't watch, and In Old Arizona, which does the cat and mouse game well enough that I can't in good faith call it a bad script. Then there are the four Elliot J. Clausen scripts. Who is Elliot J. Clausen, you may ask? I hate to say it. I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. I mean, he could be walking down the street. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know a thing. Sorry to this man. He was an extremely prolific screenwriter that wrote films for only 16 years. In these 16 years, though, he pumped out more than 80 scripts, which is just astounding. Four of them are up for the prize here, and they were so bad. A lot of people bemoan films from the 1920s as being melodramatic and over the top, but Clausen is just writing fluff here. These films are short, and the two I could see were both really dire stories that are more interesting in premise than execution. I'm guessing Clausen is getting some credit for his quantity of fluff more than his quality writing, but it's wild that we live in a world where Clausen is a four-time Oscar nominee. None of these films were nominated for any other awards, and so you aren't missing anything by skipping these goofy William Boyd vehicles. And then there's The Valiant, a Paul Muni film about a man who turns himself in for a murder, and how that affects a small-town family. This was the film debut for Muni, one of the Academy's favorite actors. He would star in only 22 films across his entire career, and he would be nominated for an Oscar for his performance in five of them, so we'll be talking about him a lot. He was nominated for The Valiant too, so I'll talk more about his performance then. For now, I'll talk about the film, which was fine and could have been great had it been a silent instead of a sound picture. The story and script were super solid, touching on themes of justice, but the sound was just awful. For one, it's got this annoying bragging energy to it, where it includes long stretches of sound effects that seem as if they're only included to show off the new technology. <laughs> And 
then there's the acting. I understand this was a transitional year, and sound mixing was rough, and the industry was still learning, but I give less of a pass to acting, as theater had been around for centuries and centuries. I'm not going to hate on a kid, but... Play. In a Shakespeare play? Yes, at school. And it's all about kings and queens and witches. Are they bad witches? I mean, come on. In fact, it's time I introduce my favorite segment of the night, the best worst acting of the Valiant. It was on just such a day that my boy Joe left home. And I'm always hoping he'll come back again on a day like this. Oh, don't be silly, honey. Oh, maybe I am silly, but that's the way I feel. My brother. For good night. If I could only have said it to him just once more. I'm mainly giving the Valiant a hard time. It's fine but it's just a symptom of this first talking picture ceremony. And when it comes to my personal pick for the prize, I'd give it to our final nominee, The Last of Mrs. Cheney. The Last of Mrs. Cheney is a drama about a socialite Mrs. Cheney who is a con woman, stringing men along while robbing them at any opportunity. I'd give the writing the award, if only because Norma Shearer's Cheney is the most well-rounded writing I've seen for a woman in this entire ceremony. And surprisingly, Mrs. Cheney was one of the nominated scripts written by a man. It was written by Hans Crayley, the same man who wrote The Patriot. And so I suspect they may have just thrown this nomination in as an extra little bonus. But the film is good. It's just so hard to recommend any of these all-talking pictures. Because the audio is just so muddied that it's impossible to ever lose yourself in the story. It was cool seeing Hedda Hopper act, though. Hopper was this uber-famous gossip columnist, but it's always fun seeing her act alongside the people she'd helped slander in the decades to come. I've done a lot of complaining about audio in these films, and so I think it would be great to take a detour to our two categories this evening that weren't negatively affected by the transition to sound. Best Cinematography and Best Art Direction. We can kind of breeze through these two, since we're starting to reach repeat nominations for most films. Six films up for cinematography, with our win going to White Shadows in the South Seas. White Shadows follows Matthew Lloyd, a doctor who visits the Marquesas Islands and is shocked by the brutal exploitation of the native islanders by the rich white traders. These traders buy pearls from the Polynesians at rates much lower than they're worth, and Lloyd decides he has to fix this. The cinematography win is so deserved. The film was shot on location in Tahiti, and the underwater photography is just breathtaking. This was my first look at what healthy coral reefs of 1928 looked like, and it's gorgeous. In general, White Shadows is at its best when depicting the island and its inhabitants and how they live. It's like Chang from our first ceremony, a time capsule of a forgotten world. But Chang was better because, ultimately, White Shadow's greatest sin is that it is the first Academy Award nominee to fall victim to the white savior trope. If you don't know, a white savior trope deals with the idea that it is the duty of white people to help racial minorities achieve their highest potential. Its danger arises in reinforcing the belief that one race is beneath the other. White Shadows is full of harmful terminology, such as calling Lloyd the white god and having him curse his own privilege. It's just pretty cumbersome, and this trope is a fairly common theme that we will see pop up pretty much every few ceremonies, even through the present day. I think White Shadows deserved its cinematography win, but it is still a bit insidious. To be honest, the only other film that I feel earned its shot at the prize was Our Dancing Daughters, the Joan Crawford flappers piece. As I mentioned earlier, it's extremely well defined. Like these shots just seem very intentional and do a great job complementing these sets and props and backdrops. 
It's a great reminder that good cinematography doesn't just mean keeping the camera moving. A camera can be static and still frame the world of a movie extremely well. I don't think Our Dancing Daughters deserve to win, but it's the only other one I really cared for. And then there's Four Devils, which I couldn't watch because it's another Say the line, Bart! Lost film. Yay! But I've always been aware of Four Devils. It's one of the ten or so most sought after lost films ever. Like, I've been wanting to see this for years. It was directed by F.W. Murnau and starring Janet Gaynor, their collective follow-up to Sunrise, and you know my thoughts on Sunrise. It's about four orphans who create a trapeze artist group that they call the Four Devils, and the few images that do exist from the film show that its cinematography was probably nothing short of spectacular. The status of Four Devils is a fun and depressing story, too. Allegedly, the only surviving print was given to lead actress Mary Duncan, and it was never seen again. Some sources say that she either burned it or drowned it in her pool. Is drowned it the right terminology there? Like, what does that even mean? But it's become an urban legend of sorts, and it's one of my white whales to one day watch. Right now, it's reluctantly another ding on the lost film counter. But I have hopes that one day I'll be able to start shrinking this number down. The Divine Lady was nominated too an extremely dry, mundane romance film that was depressingly nominated in three categories tonight, meaning I'm going to be talking about this twice more. Its cinematography was good, but an art direction nod would make much more sense. There are some large-scale swashbuckling sequences that are really fun in the old Hollywood was so crazy kind of way. The scale of this film is just something to behold. But we'll talk more about the film soon enough, and so for now, I will move swiftly along and never look back. Our final two nominees are two films we've already discussed. One is In Old Arizona, the western with the Cisco Kid, and great shots such as this one. Again, I love In Old Arizona. Is it my favorite film of the night? No, not at all. It's a bad movie amidst a sea of mediocrity. I mean, genuinely, I don't think there ever was or ever will be a ceremony with as many bad films as this one. To return to my Oregon Trail analogy, In Old Arizona is like a death by tripping over an armadillo. It's better than dysentery. It's certainly not gold, but it's a death you can't help but laugh at. Does that analogy make any sense? I've been talking about the Second Academy Awards for over a half hour now, and I really think I'm losing it. Finally, the last film considered for cinematography was Street Angel, which was the weird situation where this film was actually nominated at the previous ceremony as well. I don't know how it was eligible for this ceremony, though. The eligibility period for the Academy here was August 1928 through July 1929, and Street Angel came out April 1928, so it doesn't make sense. And this film gets two nominations tonight. It's up for both cinematography and art direction, and I didn't care for either aspect. If you want my thoughts on the film, check out my previous breakdown, but I'll give you a little taste and say I didn't like it. Best Art Direction Best Art Direction is technically a new category this year, but it's just Best Interior Design under a different, more all-encompassing name. As mentioned, we've got a nomination for Street Angel. Fine, I don't think it was going to win. There are two nominations for William Cameron Menzies, our reigning champion and the man who created the role of production designer in the first place. The first is Alibi, our Best Picture nominee about a man who has tried for a crime despite having a rock-solid alibi. I suppose the jail sets are nice, and everything feels sturdy, but I'm glad Menzies didn't win on name recognition alone, as I don't think Alibi was anything special. He was also nominated for The Awakening, another lost film, but one that sounds like absolutely nothing special. For the first time, we're starting to see films covered by independent journalists in small publications, which means we get some gems of reviews for films like The Awakening. Here's one of my favorites, from Harrison's Reports. Harrison basically sums up the entire film for us, while letting us know which parts of the movie are deeply pathetic. Beyond the Minzy's nods, the Academy also considered Dynamite for the win. I actually really like Dynamite, but I may have been the only person in the world who really liked Dynamite. The sets were fun and extremely varied, from a dilapidated mining town to a regal country club. This was a Cecil B. DeMille film and DeMille would eventually be known for his huge, commanding epics. His plots are often all over the place, and Dynamite is no exception, 
with a wild plot I'll quickly summarize. Let's put 90 seconds on the clock. Basically, there's a woman named Cynthia who is extremely money hungry. Her grandfather is dead, and in order to inherit his millions, there's a clause that requires her to be married by her 23rd birthday. Her first choice is a man named Roger, who is married, but his wife is having an affair. Cynthia convinces them to divorce and is set to marry Roger. However, she wants more money, and there's this dude named Hagen Dirk. Hagen is about to be given the death penalty, but he wants to provide for his family before he dies, and so he offers his body in a newspaper, which Cynthia pays for. Just as he's about to die, though, Hagen gets set free. He finds his new wife, Cynthia, and she's, like, shocked that he's still alive and tries to undo their agreement because he's already married to Roger. Hagen confronts Roger at a dinner party, and the entire party goes nuts. All of the men get mad, and the women get around. Aroused, I guess. Then Hagen yells at Cynthia and tells her to leave for good, but Cynthia now has no husband and won't get the will money, so she goes after Hagen, who tells her he'll marry her if she cooks and cleans, I guess. Cynthia agrees, and the next day, while grocery shopping, she buys a present for a little boy, who is so excited that he runs out into the street and gets hit by a car. The boy needs a brain specialist to save his life, as he only has hours to live, and so Cynthia saves him, spending $2,000 on a doctor, which gets Hagen really mad again, I guess. Hagen decides to blow off steam by entering an abandoned mine, and Roger and Cynthia search for him. They find Hagen, but a cave-in traps the trio inside with only 15 minutes of air. They find a stick of dynamite which they can use to break open the cave but in doing so one of them will be blown up and die Hagen and Roger flip a coin to determine who will be stuck with that honor and Roger wins Roger hits the dynamite blowing himself up and Hagen and Cynthia end the film by remembering that Roger was ultimately a very good man he was a great guy so that's dynamite they don't make movies like that anymore probably for good reason but honestly, it's movies like this one that made this whole deep dive tolerable. I can only take so many the divine ladies of the world. Our last losing nod was The Patriot. This is the lost best picture that, for all intents and purposes, seemed destined to win this award. The Academy loves the period piece, especially when said piece has period-accurate costumes and sets. From what I can tell about The Patriot, that seems to be its strongest attribute, and so I'm a bit surprised it didn't win tonight. But our winning film is The Bridge of San Luis Rey. When a rope bridge snaps in the Andes Mountains and sends five people to their deaths, a priest sets out to determine why this tragedy could have occurred. I really want to see this. The plot sounds super interesting, and assuming the bridge reflects what is seen on the poster, I can imagine the production design being grand and visually unique from any other film tonight. Unfortunately, for now, that's all I can say about this work. Best Actor the remaining three categories are all super interesting, and while Best Actor is certainly less interesting than the wild story of the Best Actress race, it's a massive step up from the first ceremony, with some good performances by actors that will become Academy darlings. To start, I think it's interesting that Emil Yannings wasn't considered for The Patriot, the lost Best Picture nominee, as Yannings won the top prize at the inaugural ceremony, and The Patriot was certainly considered for every award tonight. I suppose, though, that his co-star, Louis Stone, was considered, meaning that perhaps Yannings is more of a supporting role? I don't know, as again, I couldn't see it. So, Stone was nominated, his first and only nomination. I feel bad because I can't really say if it was deserved, but it's kind of par of the course for Stone, who is really a tragic Hollywood figure. His death would eventually come when a group of neighborhood kids were throwing stones, go figure, at his garage. Lewis chased them down the street, suffering a massive heart attack and dying on the pavement. A photo of the incident was pretty tastelessly posted in the newspapers. So Lewis Stone loses his only shot at the prize tonight. But I guess there can only be one winner. The next nominee is Paul Muni from The Valiant. This one is interesting. If you don't know who Paul Muni is, he's really the first actor I'd credit as an Academy darling. At this point, dozens of actors could be classified as such. People who get Oscar nominations in tiny roles mostly due to their name and status. Muni was known for playing historical figures in biopics, which I mean, biopic is basically the Oscars' favorite genre. But Muni was nominated here for The Valiant. That's the film that I just showed the montage of its worst acting. Well, what kind of work did you do? I mean, what was your business? Oh, I... I'm sort of jack of all trades. He was certainly good, but not great. And interestingly enough, Muni's career was basically over in April 1930. In addition to starring in The Valiant, Muni had starred in a lost film called Seven Faces, where he played seven roles. 
Unfortunately, both of these movies were considered unremarkable to Fox, Muni's parent company, and the studio let him go. So, in April 1930, when he was nominated for an Oscar, he had no future movie projects, and had left Hollywood to return to Broadway. It wasn't until three years later that he would return to Hollywood, starring in the box office smash, Scarface. From that point on, Muni was destined for greatness. Again, we're going to be talking about him pretty much every few years for the rest of his life. I actually think he'd be my choice for the win tonight, too. He wasn't astounding in The Valiant, but he certainly has a presence about him that is unlike any other actor of the time. That's one of the many perks of doing a deep dive like this into the year's films. Suddenly, a performance like Muni's stands out all the more. Another nominee was Chester Morris from Alibi. Morris plays the man convicted with the airtight alibi, and it was this performance that made me realize four of our five nominees play criminals. I don't know why, and I don't see any mention of this anywhere, but Morris, Muni, and our final two nominees, George Bancroft and Warner Baxter, all play criminals. This reads more like a trivia note than anything else, but unfortunately it kind of makes Chester Morris a little worse in comparison. Like it would be one thing to compare him to Lewis Stone, who plays a count. But when we see these other actors chewing up their scenery, or really understanding the ramifications of the death penalty, it makes Morris's average performance a bit worse by comparison. Honestly, I would have loved to see someone else up for the award. But Bancroft definitely plays the criminal the best. Honestly, with every film tonight, I've either just liked the work, sometimes ironically, or I just straight up didn't like it. It's a far cry from Ceremony 1, where I loved maybe half of the films. The only film that I truly loved tonight was Thunderbolt. It's a shame that this is the only category Thunderbolt is recognized in. The picture is a loose remake of Underworld, one of the works from our first ceremony that I really connected with. It follows a man named Thunderbolt, who faces off against the police while planning to kill anyone who has their eyes on his girl Ritzy. And come on, it's fantastic! I'm fully aware I'm probably hyping it up more just because of all the true junk I watched this year, but we finally have a sound film that truly takes advantage of the medium. In 1929, sound was off to a bit of a rocky start. The studios and audiences were certainly ready to embrace it, but directors like Sergei Eisenstein or Alfred Hitchcock were less enthused. They felt sound could be an oppressive distraction on a visual medium. It was Sternberg who really saw sound's potential first. According to Before Dietrich, Sound Technique, and Thunderbolt, von Sternberg saw sound as another way to stimulate audience imagination. This can be seen throughout Thunderbolt. Take this scene when Ritzy argues with Thunderbolt. Fay Ray shows her emotion on her face, but is punctuated by the audio cue of Ritzy nervously pawing piano keys. Or this scene, where Thunderbolt adds to the tension of a scene by squeezing a stress ball, which pierces the moment with shrill squeaking. Thunderbolt is full of moments like these, and it should not be unnoticed. Director Ludwig Berger noticed in 1929, calling Thunderbolt the first rounded out and artistically elaborated sound film. Again, when watching so many of these films in rapid succession, Thunderbolt's achievement is monumental. But the only nomination this work would receive was Best Actor, for Bancroft's imposing, unrelenting Thunderbolt. Our winner is Warner Baxter, for his work on In Old Arizona. Baxter plays the Cisco Kid, the outlaw on the run from the police in our first Western to be up for Oscars. In Old Arizona really has three leads, and so part of me speculates that his co-stars Edmund Lowe and Dorothy Burgess helped his chances by sabotaging their own performances. What? I just, I just shook hands with him. Ooh, I'm kidding, of course, but I am confident that Baxter is only considered good here because of the utter weakness of his co-stars. Baxter should consider himself extremely lucky, as he wasn't even supposed to star in the film. The star was actually supposed to be the film's director, Raoul Walsh. You may remember him from directing and starring in last year's contender, Sadie Thompson. That was actually his final film as an actor. Because, while on location shooting in Old Arizona, Walsh was driving his car when a jackrabbit jumped through his windshield, causing a crash. He would lose his right eye in this accident, giving him the iconic eye patch he would be known for his entire life. But unfortunately, he couldn't star as the Cisco Kid anymore, 
and Warner Baxter took over in a role that would ultimately win him the Oscar. There are two awards left. One is full of secret campaigning at tea parties, drug addiction, and posthumous nominations, and the other is Best Director. Let's abbreviate Best Director. Five men are nominated. Ernst Lubitsch, Frank Lloyd, Irving Cummings, Harry Beaumont, and Lionel Barrymore. We've already learned a bit about Harry Beaumont. He made two films this year, Our Dancing Daughters and The Broadway Melody. He's nominated for The Broadway Melody, and his direction here is fine. I imagine this was a film Beaumont had very little to do with, given he was brought on after the script was done and MGM had poured thousands into the production already. Ernst Lubitsch was up for The Patriot. I imagine Lubitsch had a lot to do here, and I would love to see it given his flair for comedy, but you know the drill. Irving Cummings was nominated for In Old Arizona, the film that I just attributed to Raoul Walsh. In actuality, Walsh directed the film at first, but his car accident lost him both his starring role and his directing duties. Most publications at the time list this as a joint directing effort, but I suspect that this is more courtesy to Walsh than an indicator that he actually directed much. Cummings was the only man nominated tonight, if that's any proof. Then there was Lionel Barrymore for Madame X, a really odd film. It stars Ruth Chatterton in a role that she would be nominated for. She plays a woman on trial for murdering her lover. The sound here is really bad, and so I didn't pick up on all of the plot's intricacies, try as I might. And also, what's up with the crime films? This isn't even the only film in our Best Actress race about a woman on trial for murder. I don't know if it's the case of the Academy not finding merit in comedies or what the deal is, but seriously, half of these films are either a man facing off against the police or a woman on trial for a crime. I guess I found them mostly interesting, especially because we're pre-code, meaning we get some out there moments like Chatterton kissing her son passionately. Huh? But it's just a lot of crime and it makes me wish we had more love for some of our silent comedies, even if they were seen as ancient in 1930. The most interesting aspect to Madame X is that it was directed by Lionel Barrymore. Lionel Barrymore was the older brother of John Barrymore, the great uncle to Drew Barrymore, and I'll just let you know that we're probably going to be talking about someone in the Barrymore family from pretty much now until the 1980s. They really did it all, and there's no better indicator of that than Lionel. Lionel was an actor primarily, but here he is earning a nod for his direction. He also was a revolutionary director too. One thing you'll notice in these early sound pictures is that actors spend an awful lot of time near flower pots and bushes and other objects that concealed microphones. Lionel was the first to bring a microphone on set and hold it above the eye of the camera, something that certainly didn't do much to help Madame X. Now I think I'll just go and rest a little while. Huh? In addition to acting and directing, Lionel was also a jack of all trades. His 1954 obituary describes that his musical compositions had been played and well-reviewed, his paintings were regarded as far better than average, and his etchings were considered by many among the best of our time. But I'm glad he didn't win tonight, as I don't think his directing was anything more than stagey. Our winner is Frank Lloyd. He's nominated for three works tonight, which remains the highest honor any director has ever held and probably ever will hold for most films in a single night. The first was Drag, which I couldn't watch, but which was called Drab and Irritating. Then there was Weary River, which I would call Drab and Irritating. It follows, say it with me now, a gangster and his life of crime. It also stars Richard Barthelmus, who was one of two nominees for Best Actor last year, and whom I really don't like at all. He's no good here either. I don't really understand what his appeal was. Weary River is part crime film, part musical, a truly cursed combination, and Barthelmus doesn't even do his own singing here. Apparently this was controversial at the time, and it got out that Barthelmus wasn't singing or playing the piano, and he was so embarrassed that he put it in his contract that he would never sing or dance in a film again. All in all, he just seems like a peach to be around. Frank Lloyd would win for his work on The Divine Lady, which I called dry earlier, but Lloyd does deserve some credit for his managing of some huge set pieces and moving parts. The Divine Lady isn't a very good film, but it holds the unique distinction of being the only picture to win Best Director and not even be nominated for Best Picture. Given the immense overlap these categories often share, I expect that may never happen again. I won't give a super in-depth breakdown on Lloyd in the interest of time, but we'll be talking about him a few more times in future years. His three nominations here are impressive, 
but according to famed critic Andrew Serres, Lloyd was largely a studio director. His style is as much the style of the studio as it is his own. He did not make waves, he did not overly publicize and promote himself. What he did was for the good of the studio, not for his own ego. We have one category left, and it is easily the best and most interesting of the night. Best Actress, commonly referred to today as the award that Mary Pickford bought. In a general sense, the acting awards have long been the ones that people have sold their souls to obtain, but Pickford was the first to realize how impactful these awards can be, and she was the first to do anything to get one. She would win for Coquette, but the story actually begins a few years earlier. We first must understand that Pickford was known as the girl with the curls. Her most famous role was probably Pollyanna, where she played a child. Since then, Pickford had continuously been cast as children, despite being well into her 20s. Throughout the 1920s, Pickford attempted to break free of the little girl persona she had created, starring in more adult roles that would show her serious acting chops. She also was one of the first actors with complete creative control. In 1919, she created the studio United Artists, along with Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, and D.W. Griffith. This gave her complete creative control over the types of films she made and the roles that she took. When the jazz singer released, Pickford was one of the first to see the potential of the sound film, and she immediately began looking for material that could mark her first foray into the talking picture world. Coquette was the role she was looking for. The story follows a southern girl who defends her father after he kills the man she loves. It's somewhat gone with the wind in that it follows a precocious girl that is strong-willed and borderline psychotic. But Pickford felt it would be a great role for her to prove once and for all she was no longer the girl with curls. She would cut her curls for the film, fully embracing a new look. And she wanted to nail the southern accent too. Aren't they just adorable? Upon hearing early footage of her voice on film, she remarked, Why, that sounds like a little pipsqueak voice. And so Pickford began vocal training. When it came time to start production, she was a wreck. She fired her sound man, her cameraman, and anyone who she felt was sabotaging the film. When her longtime friend, Charles Rocher, yelled cut during the middle of one of her takes, she fired him too. When the film finally premiered, it was a moderate success, but Pickford's new look didn't land for audiences. She had spent much of her career playing the pigtailed girl, and she was now trying to portray a borderline flapper. To share my own opinion, I agree. I'm not super familiar with Pickford's girls with curls roles, but when I'm comparing Pickford's young rebellious woman to Joan Crawford's young rebellious woman, the difference is night and day. Pickford comes across as a tad out of touch, and her voice unfortunately doesn't fit the role. But Pickford wanted this role to be one she was remembered for. Although the Academy was still small at 365 members, Pickford began inviting the judges over to her home and offering them tea. It's rumored that she then lobbied for herself, arguing her role was deserving of the major award. The line between lobbying and marketing is a thin one, and so perhaps it is unfair to hold this against Pickford, but you have to remember that this ceremony was one where the nominees were not even announced. None of our other leading ladies knew they stood a shot at the prize, and so they had neither the means nor the idea to advertise themselves in the same manner as Pickford. If anything, I'm okay with Pickford winning, because, like Charlie Chaplin the year prior, silent actors would soon be thrown to the wayside to make room for the next generation of movie stars. And Pickford is absolutely deserving of some credit for her place in Hollywood history, as one of the only women to truly hold power in the male-dominated industry. Did she deserve to win for Coquette? No, not as far as I'm concerned, but I'm okay if this is a legacy award for her life in film. I would have given the prize to Jean Eagles for her work in The Letter. The Letter follows a woman on trial for the murder of her husband, certainly not a unique plot for 1929, but Eagles plays the role with an independence that is strikingly different from the whining and shrieking of some other actresses this year. She comes across as strong-willed and rootable, and it made the letter one of my favorite films of the year, in all honesty. Unfortunately, Eagles' nomination tonight was posthumous. Eagles was a notorious drug and alcohol abuser, and her addiction had led to her death a few months earlier.
Anytime an actor or actress is nominated posthumously, it adds a touch of sadness to their role. When Leslie ultimately gets sentenced near the end of the film, there's a deep longing in her eyes that is either a very good performance or a very poignant reflection of her life. There were four more nominees of varying talent. I couldn't watch Betty Compson in The Barker, but Compson was a super prolific star, often making as many as 25 films in a single year. The Barker does exist in archives, and so I hope that one day I can see Compson's performance. And then there are three nominees from films we've already discussed. Roof Chatterton for Madame X, the film directed by actor, painter, horticulturist Lionel Barrymore. Chatterton is fine, she's another woman on trial for her crime, her tears in one of the film's final scenes look incredibly fake. There was Corinne Griffith for The Divine Lady, the swashbuckling period piece. Griffith was unremarkable. And finally, there was Bessie Love for The Broadway Melody, meaning we will end this retrospective as we began. Love was great here. I want to make sure she gets her dues. Again, The Broadway Melody wasn't just one of the best sound films of the year. It more or less shaped what sound films could be. Love's enthusiasm for her role bounces off of the screen, and she is fun and all over the place and dances with the poise of a professional. Bessie Love has been largely forgotten these days, but she was a phenomenal singer-dancer-songwriter that really cared for her roles. After appearing in 1927's Dress Parade, she wrote a book on her experiences on set. She enjoyed performing for people so much that she had taught herself how to play the ukulele, a skill she would use in many films, including the Broadway Melody. In 1926's The King on Main Street, she performs the first documented exhibition of the Charleston, popularizing the dance in American culture. Is Love a great actress? No. But she truly enjoyed movie making, and she gives a buoyancy to the Broadway melody that helps it stay afloat. To end this video, I want to return to Sid Silverman's review of the Broadway melody. The possibilities are what jolt the imagination. 1929 is thought of today as maybe the worst year in film history, and the Broadway Melody is thought of as maybe the worst film to ever win. But to filmgoers at the time, they were witnessing a revolution, and everyone knew they hadn't seen nothing yet. If you enjoyed this video, I'd love it if you liked the video and left a comment sharing your favorite films of the year and what future ceremonies excite you most. We're done with the 1920s now, and every future decade takes the awards more seriously, which means we've got some really fun stories and films to talk about. Thank you so much for the support on my first episode, and I hope to see you soon in your best dresses and suits when we break down our next ceremony. Until then, I'll see you at the movies.